Um, all right, so I'm I'm very, very pleased to introduce today Dr. Katie Yeltsieri, who is the lead of the uh, uh, lead PI of the Ocean Women Program at University of Cape Town in uh, South Africa. And uh, Katie is a senior lecturer in the oceanography department at UCT. <clears throat> and um, she has a BSc in chemistry and a PhD in oceanography. And she was a, a NOAA Climate and Global Change postdoctoral fellow for two years, and then spent another two years as a postdoctoral research um, associate, and jointly appointed at Princeton University and Brown University. After the, the, her postdoctoral time, Katie pursued a, a master's in public policy at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Um, she has received the Peter B. Uh, Wagner Award for Women in Atmospheric Science in 2008 and the Claude Leon Merritt Award uh, from the University of Cape Town in 2017. Currently, Katie's interests include air pollution in coastal cities, the impacts of human activities on surface ocean biogeochemistry, and studying the remote marine atmosphere of the Southern Ocean as a proxy to understand more about atmospheric chemistry and climate during the, the pre-industrial. But uh, I think uh, to, for today, Katie's gonna be focusing on the, uh, uh, her initiatives with the Ocean Women's Program. So welcome, Katie, and very much looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much, Brian. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. OK, the classic online seminar question. Can you hear me? Can you see the slides? It's all perfect, Katie. Sorry. Cool. Um, go ahead. OK, great. Thanks very much. Um, as Brian said, today I'm going to share with you all about the Ocean Women program. I'm not going to be talking directly about my science. I'm the lead PI in this program, but I want to acknowledge the co-principal investigators who um, have led this work with me, Isabel Ansorga, Sarah Fawcett, Juliet Hermes, and recently we've added uh, our newest academic staff member at UCT Oceanography, Moya Chabo Raguasha. And I've titled this today Strategies for Increasing the Representation of Success of Black Women in Oceanography, because I think this, I don't want to just tell you about what we did in South Africa. I want to talk to you about the lessons we've learned and particularly focus on those that I think are broadly applicable to other oceanography departments, marine science programs, the oceanographic sciences in general. So this all started um, from a new vice chancellor at the University of Cape Town. So vice chancellor is the equivalent of the president of a university. Um, she launched a proposal call as part of one of her new initiatives in 2018. And this was really quite, quite something for a new um, president to come into a university and decide this is what they're going to focus on. And she named this program, the Advancing Women Program, a call for change. And so this was a university-led initiative. This was a proposal call that only women and transgender researchers within the University of Cape Town could respond to. It had to be focused on training postgraduates and postdoctoral fellows. And the emphasis was explicitly on building capacity among Black South African women. Um, there were three different categories. Um, long story short, the one that we fall into is called For Women by Women. Um, the funding could be used for anything. There was no overhead. And to contextualize the amount for you, this was the equivalent to a very well-funded sort of full-on scientific research project that you would write a proposal to, right? So, I mean, this is not a small chunk of change. So we responded to this call as the um, women academic staff at the University of Cape Town Department of Oceanography. Our academic staff at the time was 100% white. That only changed fairly recently this year when we had a new hire. Um, greater than 50% foreign, um, as you can hear from my accent. Perhaps I'm not actually South African myself, so I fall into that white foreign category. And we had 73 postgraduate students in our department, 12 of whom were Black South African women. And if you think about in the South African context, Black South Africans make up 76% of the population. So we're not talking about a situation where minorities are underrepresented. We're talking about a situation where the majority um, are completely underrepresented. And so we wrote this proposal. We called it Seeing a Change in the Demographics of Oceanographic Research in South Africa. You should never let a good pun go unused when you're titling your proposals. But we really felt like, you know, one of the unique things about our department was that we actually had more than 50% female academic staff, which is also it's a little bit unusual for a science department. And so we came together um, to respond to this call as we felt that we were, as people who have sort of, you know, you get to a certain point in your career where you actually do have a little bit of power to change the environment around you. 
Um, and so we thought we could do that. And we wanted to, um, you know, sort of leverage this opportunity to make a difference in for Black women who come through our oceanography department. So that's how it started. Um, the aim of the program was to develop a prestigious research and leadership training program. So this was not designed to be something that was remedial in any way. The focus was on Black women. Um, I use the X in women here as that is what the vice chancellor, when she created the program, used. I know um, thoughts and feelings on the use of the X in women have changed quite a bit since then. Um, and I apologize for those who um, find that offensive, but we have left it in as it is the official text from our proposal. Um, and the vice chancellor is aware that that's something that, that we need to work on in terms of the language of this project. Regardless, to develop a prestigious research and leadership training program for Black women that recruits, retains, and enables success for the next generation of Black women oceanographers. So oceanography in South Africa is actually a pretty strong, well-developed research field. Um, there's a great geographic advantage that we have in terms of access to the Southern Ocean, access to the Indian Ocean, the South Atlantic, the Benguela upwelling system, as I'm sure many of you know, is one of the most productive in the world, um, the Agulhas Western Boundary Current. And so oceanographic research you know, has, a, has a strong history in South Africa. Um, and so it really is time to, to sort of make a change and, and um, bring some of the next generation of people through. So of course, this is a great aim, but how do you actually go about and do this, right? Easier said than done. So the objectives of the program were to first identify what the barriers were. So why, you know, why have things not been changing despite the fact that, you know, we have this large number of um, women academic staff. Why is the staff still 100% white? Um, you know, plenty of black postgraduate students from other African countries, but very few black South African women. So what are the barriers? How do we overcome them? And we decided to focus on recruitment as a stage, retention, and then of course the success. The second was to create an environment that enables Black women to succeed in their postgraduate studies and go on to become leaders in the field, both nationally and, and internationally. And I think this is one that, you know, a lot of times the focus, it's easy to stay focused on the recruitment. So what do we do to bring more people in? But if you don't change, you know, clearly the environment has systemic issues that are not allowing people to come into the program, not allowing certain people to succeed. Um, you know, there's no other way to keep the numbers that low over time without it being a really entrenched system. And so you don't want to bring people in to an environment that is downright hostile to them um, at the worst um, or, or at the least sort of not supportive. And then the third was to develop and evaluate this training program in a way that it could be applied more generally to other marine science programs in South Africa and abroad. Um, so some of it, of course, is going to be uniquely South African. It has to be. That's the local context we're operating in. Um, but quite a bit of it is not, you know, for example, one of the things that, that we identified really early on was that a lot of times experience with the ocean is a privileged experience. Um, it's, you know, sailing, diving, vacations at the beach, that sort of thing. And, and so, um, yeah, and that's, that's universal. That's not, so, you know, South Africa specific. So I want to start with the beginning. So what are the barriers to recruitment, retention, and success? So we identified three main categories. Um, financial barriers, professional barriers, and personal barriers. Um, the start, of course, the big one is financial. Um, and it might seem obvious, but I'm sure those of you, you know, who are graduate students in the audience, you know the financial hardships you take on to pursue higher education. It, it really is a privilege. Um, the first one being relocation expenses. So we have this system, and I know other universities have it the same. So you've been offered a PhD. Um, scholarship to attend the University of Cape Town, congratulations. Um, now please get yourself to Cape Town, find somewhere to stay, show up on campus, register, and in about a month or so, we'll pay you your first bursary payment. You'll get your first payment. Well, if you don't have other funds to rely on, how on earth are you supposed to get yourself to one of the most expensive cities in South Africa, find somewhere to live and feed yourself while you wait around for the university to get your paperwork processed? Um, you know, this is a, an obvious barrier for anyone who doesn't have familial support or isn't coming from a job or something like that. So that was one of the first things we identified. Um, the second was providing an extra year of stipend. So we didn't want the um, people who are part of this program to feel any pressure that they were going to run out of time. Uh, we paid for tuition and fees. It's basic. Um, laptop, but by laptop, we mean sort of any computing support that you might need. Yes, it's true. Most supervisors provide that. 
But the success of a given candidate shouldn't be dependent on whether or not they get a nice supervisor or a supervisor who has money that year, et cetera, um, and also travel support. But the financial support extends to other things that the fellows um, in the program might find useful. They want to attend summer schools or other courses or training workshop, workshops, whatever it is. We have the financial means to do that because, as I said, this was, you know, the vice chancellor of the university put real money behind this program. The second was professional barriers to success. Um, a big part of that is networking. So, um, and the, the equivalent I would say for a lot of black South African students coming into the program would be what, what I think is commonly referred to in the US and Europe as first gen students. And the networking I think in this context is really important for identifying those unknowns, you know, the things that we all know, but we don't talk about or the things that um, you sort of learn the hard way by being in, in the program. And so by creating some networking, I think what the goal was to help alleviate some of that. Some of this also is professional networking. So we know that the, the four PIs of the program as white women, um, we are not uniquely qualified to mentor young black South African women in oceanography. Yes, there are some things we can share, but really we wanted to find a way to network them with other black South African or African women in STEM um, in other ca capacities. And, and that's been, I think, probably one of the most outstanding successes of the program. Um, we had goals for things such as annual retreats and things like that, that obviously COVID has put on hold. Um, South Africa has a C-Master program on the RVSA goals too. It's the South African Icebreaker. And this was a program where we were planning on bringing the fellows on board um, so that they could have training sort of at sea, whether it was related to their um, research or not, but also to give them things like access to chief scientist training. So, you know, have them shadow the chief scientists, you know, those sorts of things that you don't always get the opportunities to do. Um, we created an orientation program for the fellows as they came into the postgrad. Um, also other professional networking, they got to have dinner with the vice chancellor. Um, we've done their own sort of boat-based orientation, which I think is really important. This really hit home for me. We had students, we always take our postgraduate students in the honors year, which is your fourth year of undergrad, um, out on the small boat. And one of the students who was actually a, a scuba diver was telling me how nervous they were about going out on the boat for this research because it was a research trip and they didn't really understand. And I thought, wow, you know, we have students who have never been on a boat in their entire lives. And here we have this kid who's a certified master diver who's nervous. I can't even imagine what some of these other students are feeling like. Um, and so we created sort of their own one-on-one -on -one orientation with the, the boat side of oceanography, if you will. And then the third one was, was the personal side of things. So this is the mentoring, the cohort building. We were very intentional to bring fellows in as a group, um, you know, so that they immediately had a, a group together. Things like uh, passports, field gear, you know, you show up for, uh, for an expedition or for field work. And, you know, some people... Um, you can clearly tell that they've, you know, been there, done that, they're wearing the right stuff, they're all prepared and other people aren't. And we wanted to make sure that that this was a barrier that we could immediately strip away. And we extended this to, to the things that are, I think, frequently culturally about oceanography, not necessarily about your research, but if the fellows wanted to engage in swimming lessons, uh, diving certifications, skipper's license, and we've had fellows take advantage of these. And this is more about just being sort of comfortable um, in the oceanography environment. Okay, so the second objective was to create an environment that enables Black women to succeed and become leaders in the field. And so some of this has to do with the department itself. So we're bringing you into the UCT Oceanography Department. Is this a comfortable space for you to study, for you to exist, for you to be around? Um, and some of the things were really interesting that came in around this, and I'll get to it in the next slide. We actually hired professionals to help us um, at this stage. One of the things that came up repeatedly that seemed so simple and, and was so surprising was the food. One of the, one of the students said, why do we always have to eat white people food? Every time we have a tea or, you know, and it's like, yeah, it's a good point. I mean, white people make up 12% of the population of South Africa. Why are we always eating white people food? You know, something as simple as that. Um, acceptable languages to speak in the corridor. South Africa has 11 official languages. You pretty much 99% of the time only hear English, or at least you used to, that's changing. Um, and so this is where attitude and, and culture come in. So we actually brought in professional consultants who specialize in diversity and transformation because we recognized very quickly that we were in over our heads when it came to understanding um, the cultural issues around the department and figuring out how to change them. And so we, focus groups were held with 15 women of color from the oceanography department that's self-identified women of color. Um, there was a very positive response to the event when we put this out. 
And what it was, was it was the, so the consultants met with these focus groups to discuss um, the Ocean Women program, to present the Ocean Women program and to solicit feedback about what individuals' experiences had been. And it was voluntary, you know, they were actually very happy to have the chance to give feedback and to try to make a, things better and make a difference. And the results from the consultants really highlighted for us the importance of demonstrating that there was a serious intent to transform the department, not just lip service, and that some of it was going to be uncomfortable. And were we comfortable, you know, were we going to be okay confronting that discomfort? Um, the importance of intake as a key time for intervention. I'll never forget one of the consultants told us that one of the women told them that they were in the department for months before they figured out where the ladies' bathroom was. But they were too scared to ask after the first week because they figured they had been there too long and would just look silly. And that's when it really hit home for me, like, wow, when you bring people into the department, like, how simple is it to show people around, right? I mean, at the least, we need to be doing this for our students. And the, the last thing was the importance of co-production um, and that we designing a program, which, of course, right, we wrote the proposal. We, you know, as our four white women academics, we designed the program. We thought it was all ready to go. And what this process helped us realize that we actually needed to take a pause and step back um, and let go a little bit of these ideas we had and, and bring in um, the Black women to help us design this. And then the last was, of course, um, doing exactly what we're doing now. So uh, working on this program in a way that we think others can learn lessons from it. So this is a screenshot from our website. Um, so the, the general plan, um, I realize I haven't actually specified the plan, was to sort of create a cohort of MSc and PhD Black women oceanographers who would become the leaders of oceanography in South Africa and indeed the global South. Um, we have funding to, to conduct research, right? That's not a problem, but the additional financial support to provide a whole cohort of students the funding, the time, the opportunities um, to really develop into scholars and leaders is something we didn't have until this program. And so that idea to sort of foster a group of women with a dedicated support system, we thought would have a much more profound impact on capacity development than just sort of slowly trickling people in. You can see this is another shot from our website. Um, and one of the key things, the reason I keep saying about leading the future of oceanography is, is since South Africa is one of the only countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that offers postgraduate degrees in oceanography, it's pretty common for South African early career scientists to be asked to represent on a slew of international panels, international scientific committees. You're asked to represent South Africa, Southern Africa, sometimes the whole Southern Hemisphere, you know, as if that's something someone can actually represent. Um, but the pool of professionals here is actually quite small. And so, you know, they'll come to South Africa, they'll look at the UCT oceanography departments, they'll want to get a young woman, you know, even better if you can check woman box, right? So woman from South Africa, check, check, check. You know, they'll ask someone like me to come join a scientific steering committee. Um, and even, you know, years ago when I was just starting my job, you know, just out of a postdoc. And then I show up and I'm this white, you know, woman with an American accent. It's not really what they're looking for. And it's not actually a really authentic representation of South African oceanographic science in these international spaces. And so this was another thinking, you know, thought process um, with the fellows for this. Okay, so... By the numbers so far, so this program started in 2018. Um, we've had three different application rounds. We currently have six postgraduate fellows. We've had one fellow already graduate and move on. Um, we've had a second one graduate and upgrade to and graduate their MSc and is now a PhD student. We have a um, Ocean Woman website that I mentioned. We average about 175 visits a month. 166 of those are new visits. Um, and they come from, the visitors come from around Sub-Saharan Africa, Europe, the U.S., everywhere. Um, it's a really nice, I think, representation and shows the interest in this. We also have an Ocean Women Twitter account, um, which you can see here has 1,200 followers. And I was talking to our social media consultant today. She said on average, our tweet gets about 47,000 views. So I think the Ocean Women program really hit a nerve um, in South Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa and is getting a lot of attention because of that. Um, so I haven't mentioned this yet, but we actually, in addition to hiring diversity consultants, we hired a social media um, consultant to help us work on the social media presence, which has been one of the best decisions we've made. Um, and in fact, one of our fellows who's really interested in science communication is actually being trained by our social media consultants 
um, and is herself now running the Ocean Women Twitter account, the Ocean Women Twitter account. So that's become sort of a cool spinoff of all of this. Now, of course, all of our fantastic plans and all of our co-production um, hit the reality of COVID. So the pandemic changed a lot of our plans for all of the in-person networking we were planning on doing. Um, the focus shifted to online mentoring sessions. I've got a screenshot here of the fellows meeting with Dr. Jacqueline Uku. Um, so in, in some ways it's been kind of cool because the, we've been able to set up these online mentoring sessions with the fellows with a sort of broader swath of women. Um, but, you know, obviously nothing replaces the sort of inline, you know, face to face. Um, the online, the networking sessions are just for the fellows and the mentor. They get together. One of our fellows hosts them formally um, and they have a sort of Zoom or Skype conversation focused on all different topics. Um, and the fellows have have really focused, told us repeatedly that this is the most valuable aspect of the program for them. Um, we as the PIs, I had one co-PI in particular who really thinks, you know, we should be meeting with the fellows all the time and talking with them and all these things. And we've heard from the fellows repeatedly that they really have very little interest in meeting with us repeatedly. Um, they would much rather be spending their time with, with the women who, who look like them and women they can learn from. The other thing with the pandemic, obviously the boat-based activities have slowed down. Hopefully next year those will start to pick up. But there's been a real, I think, increased role of social media in the program. Um, I think the, in part because of the pandemic, I think also in part because of things happening globally, you know, these hashtag black in um, series that you keep seeing for those of you who are on Twitter, you know, a lot of that has been happening simultaneously. And so I think the role that things like Twitter play um, in science communication and in science networking has, has really changed rapidly over the last couple of years. And the Ocean Women program has um, thankfully been on top of that. So the fellows have all done blog posts. Um, and these for the um, websites, they've been given, you know, opportunity to sort of speak about whatever it is that they choose to speak about on their blog posts. These have received amazing traction, particularly with high school students, um, young Black South African women who, you know, are just entering university now. These blog posts have um, made a real difference because it's not just seeing women who look like them doing the work, but hearing actually their voice, their experience. And so this is just a screenshot from our website. Um, this is another one of our various um, cohorts. And then uh, blog posts also about some really negative experiences that some of the women have had in science. I think it took quite a bit of bravery for Kalisa to write a blog post about an experience she had um, while on a Southern Ocean research cruise. Um, and I think it's important to also, you know, to not just put out the rah, rah, you know, everything's great, look at what all these women are doing, but to really put out the reality that this is not necessarily always going to be an easy path. There's lots still that has to change, in particular field-based science, I think is, is um, a place where we're just, just starting the, the cusp of making the changes that need to be changed. Um, and these blog posts, I think from the fellows, where that gives them a voice and amplifies them, I think has um, really been important in allowing them to sort of take ownership of the way the, the program is presented. The other um, aspect is the Twitter takeover. So each of our fellows have done a takeover, a social media takeover on the Twitter account, which has been really cool. And they have each said that the number of followers that they personally have had on Twitter has skyrocketed um, as a result of these Twitter takeovers. And it's actually led more than another fellow to become really interested in science communication. Um, Kolisa Sinyanya here, she's super active on science communication. She's the one I was telling you is um, actually now running the Ocean Twitter account. She has 12,000 followers, um, has been doing some really amazing stuff. Um, but the combination, I think, of the social media and the Ocean Women and, and putting these fellows out there, right? These women who would have been graduate students, sort of, you know, the, the typical suffering through in their own um, own office in the department, you know, hoping things work out by joining the Ocean Women program, they sort of immediately become a part of something that's much bigger than themselves. And opportunities have come as a result of that. Um, here's on the left, you can see a photo of Kalisa. She was featured in a CNN Africa story. Um, on the right, Faith um, was invited to present at the Oasis workshop, which is one of the UN Ocean Decade programs. She gave a presentation there. Faith has also um, joined and, and been part of an online mentoring um, network where she's the mentor for younger um, Black women across Africa who are interested in science, which is also really cool. 
So the programs received interest from the broader community. Um, so there's really, there's a desire, I think, generally across the earth science community to be doing more to support um, groups who are underrepresented, groups who are marginalized, and groups who have been, you know, sort of systematically and systemically excluded from science. And so when they hear about a program like this, that, that we're trying to make some headway on this, I think it does generate some interest because the um, saying there's a problem is easy, but sort of trying to figure out what to do about that problem is not easy. And so there was a PLOS One blog. Um, there's also a case study from the Commonwealth Blue Charter, um, which is something I hadn't heard of until they reached out to do a, a case study, to be honest, but it's uh, South Africa is a Commonwealth country, so they're part of this and they have this um, oceanographic focus. Um, and so they did a case study on ocean women. But I want to, so that's sort of quite a bit of introduction to the program and, um, you know, some of the things we're trying to do, but I really want to focus a bit on the, the lessons learned. So this started in 2018. We've done some, some things right, we've done some things wrong. Um, and so the lessons learned sort of generally cover these topics here. I think the first is that if a university or a department, whatever the level is, is interested in doing something to change the culture, to actually increase the representation of um, any sort of marginalized group, it has to have a financial investment. Um, this isn't something that can be done, you know, with a, the sort of shoestring budget. You have to put your money where your mouth is. Um, and that, yeah, I mean, so if someone comes and says, oh, you know, we're gonna, we're really interested in DEI or whatever it is, and, you know, our department's gonna do this, that, and the other thing, and you say, all right, cool, what's the budget? It's nothing, all right, well, you know, in some ways you, you get out what you put in. The other lesson I think um, is support from the top. Um, this is something that obviously we have no control over who runs our universities, but having the support from the top has really allowed us to highlight Ocean Women as a prestigious program that sort of gets face time around the university. Um, I, as I mentioned, you know, our fellows had dinner with the vice chancellor at her house, you know, the sort of, um, you know, very fancy type of, of president's house. It's really critical, right, in terms of highlighting for the fellows themselves the role that they're playing, but also highlighting the role that the program um, plays. A very more general lesson that, that one can have control of is co-production. So one example I can give you is the logo for Ocean Women. We hired a designer, local black woman designer to come up with a bunch of logo ideas. And as the PIs, we never in a million years would have gone with um, the logo that we ended up with. It was actually the fellows who, who designed this and, and loved the idea of the, the sort of setup we had. Um, and that was something that was, yeah, I just, you know, we wouldn't really would not have done this. Um, and in terms of the meeting, the needs of the fellows, like I said, you know, we would have set up all these structured meetings with us, you know, we'll, we'll mentor the fellows, you know, and what we found from them in this co-production process is it's not actually what they need, it's not what they want. Um, and so it's been really critical to sort of let go of the ideas we have about what this program should be and embrace some of the ideas that the fellows have of what this program should be and what they need. Another really important one is the willingness to have uncomfortable conversations getting it wrong. I initially referred to the fellows as women of color. They told me they don't want, they're not women of color, they're black women. Not a problem, noted. Got it wrong, you have to change it. When it comes to changing the departmental culture, of course, us as the PIs of the program think this is really important. And to be frank, not all of our, our academic staff members think things like this need to happen. And so how do you how do you handle that? How do you have that uncomfortable conversation with your colleagues, other staff members who don't you know, sort of understand why this is so important or why you're putting all this money and time into this? And how do you have those conversations with the fellows where you explain that, that the reality is that not everyone's on board? Um, another one, so, and on that same vein, I'll jump to the, the MOU with supervisor and student is really important. So we insisted, of course, now we have some power in this situation with um, staff members who aren't fully on board because we're completely financially supporting their students. Um, and so they can't be, you know, too, too difficult about it because they're getting essentially a free postgraduate student, a well-funded student who has, you know, a laptop travel, all those things taken care of. And so we insisted that the supervisors signed a memorandum of understanding with us and the student, recognizing that um, the support needed for them to be part of Ocean Women activities. So recognizing that they were going to be taking part in these mentoring activities, for example. Um, 
Another one is professional support when needed. So as I mentioned, we brought in social media consultants because we don't know anything about social media. We brought in professional consultants who work in diversity and transformation because I'm not qualified to lead conversations um, you know, with young Black women talking about microaggressions they've experienced and negative, you know, things they've experienced. And, you know, that there are people who do that for a living and you need to bring those people in when it comes down to it. Another one is the co-benefits. There have been a lot of co-benefits across the department. You know, things like identifying the important of importance of orientation. You know, that's not just for our fellows now. We do that for all new students because obviously it's not just the Ocean Women Fellows who have had a problem with this. Um, and things like gear. So um, one of the things we learned, you know, the importance of the, the Ocean Women program, you know, of course, we've got lots of swag, right? All the gear the fellows would need, whether it's stuff for going to the Southern Ocean or whether it's just things like T-shirts or masks now. Um, but one of the things we learned is that it's actually really important to make sure all of our students are branded. So you can imagine a situation where um, we take the students out on a small boat uh, at a place called Simonstown, which is just like every other small town that has a marina, you know, it's like a little bit hoity-toity, a little bit fancy. And there's a bunch of young black people hanging around with book bags near a boat. Somebody might come along and say, you know, hey, do you guys belong here? And that's not appropriate. And that's not something that we want to put our students in that situation. And one of the things we've learned is that by providing UCT oceanography gear, it can give them a layer of insulation, uh, you know, against that kind of commentary. And so we've made sure to extend that. So all of the, every single student who comes through UCT Oceanography has a, you know, is able to um, get as much gear as they need to feel comfortable and give them a bit of that armor. Um, and then the, the last two, I think that are the most important is that the, the white staff need to lead and need to identify their sphere of influence. And this is a situation where you can't rely on co-production. You can't rely on asking marginalized groups or underrepresented groups what they need from you. If you are a black woman in South Africa working in oceanography, you have had to take time and emotional energy to figure out how to navigate a space that was not designed for you. That is time and emotional energy that takes away from your research. And so the flip side is that white staff need to take time and emotional energy on their own to figure out how to make changes without actually having to um, you know, rely on anyone to tell them. We are professional researchers. We are more than capable to researching things like decentering whiteness, um, anti-racist training, you know, all of that. We're, we're capable of doing it. And yes, it will take time away from your research. Yes, it will be difficult. Yes, it will be uncomfortable. But nonetheless, you have to do it. And I always think back to this, this um, you know, and some people will say, oh, it's not my thing. You know, it's not, I don't really want to be a part of this. And this idea that you know, when a mount, when an elephant is stepping on a mouse, you standing around and saying, oh, "I'm not really going to participate," means you are on the elephant's side. So by doing nothing, you have explicitly chosen a side. You have chosen to be part of the oppressive system, and so you need to find a way to get out of that narrative um, and make a change, regardless of how small it is. Again, identify your sphere of influence and do what you can. So the success of the Ocean Women program um, has nothing to do with us and everything to do with the fellows. This is our, our group of fellows when they had um, dinner with the vice chancellor at her house. Um, everything about the program is because these are phenomenal women um, who have put themselves out there to be successful, who have put themselves out there to carry difficult conversations, um, who are willing to be role models. And I want to take a moment before I wrap up um, to say their names and introduce you to them because I think they are the future of oceanography coming out of South Africa. Um, top left, we have Tando Mazomba who finished her MSc in Applied Ocean Sciences. She's now working on introducing oceanography curriculum to high school learners, um, mentoring students, and doing some environmental science consulting work. Tizukazi Yapi, or known as Ruru, is finishing up her MSc and is looking to um, do a PhD. Wanjiru Tortoi is from uh, Kenya. She finished her MSc last year with distinction, which is uh, quite a high recognition at ECT. Um, her MSc went out to two international external examiners who both recommended that it was one of the top 10% of dissertations they've read. She's now engaged in a PhD. She just had a paper come out in GRL a couple of weeks ago. Kolisa Sinyanya is a finishing PhD student. She's the one who's the real Twitter presence. She has her own superhero after her. She's a force to be reckoned with. Kalile Mbula is a new PhD student who just joined the program, as is Lerato Mpishea. She's also a new PhD student. She was working 
quite high up in the modeling um, of division of CSIR, which is South Africa's government lab, and decided that she wanted to pursue a PhD so she could take things to the next level. And then lastly, we have Faith February here, who's also a PhD student. Um, finishing PhD student, one I just told you, who was uh, giving a talk at Oasis. And so I just want to end by with a little two minute video, letting the fellows talk to you themselves. And then after that, I'll be happy to take questions. I study aerosols at the interface of the ocean and atmosphere from observational data collected in Falls Bay, South Africa. The aim of this study is to improve our understanding and characterization of aerosols that serve as input to prediction models for climate change. The sterling support and excellent exposure that I get from the Ocean Women program help to keep me motivated to succeed in my academic career. I'm a final year PhD candidate in oceanography. My research is part of a growing body of work that critically examines biogeochemical cycling in the ocean, particularly regions that are currently undersampled. Ocean Women has advanced my academic journey as resources and quality funding are offered. The mentor-mentee program enriches my way of thinking as a black woman in science and has broadened my mind regarding possibilities I could create with my expertise. My project focuses on primary productivity in the Benguela upwelling system. I feel honored that I am a woman who is being empowered by Ocean Women. Being part of the Ocean Woman has given me the opportunity to advance my academic career and develop invaluable skills in oceanography. I am a second year master student in ocean and atmospheric science and I tend to experience a lot of inertia when it comes to thinking about the future and my career. And so being part of a dynamic group of women who are on mission and who are optimistic about what they have to offer has really encouraged me and given me that spark. Um, and just to take initiative and to develop a greater sense of ownership over my path. Hi, and happy Women's Month. My name is Tando Mazomba and I'm a marine scientist. My research focuses on assessing climate model outputs in the Southern Ocean in the last century using historical commercial humpback whale catch data. Being an ocean woman has encouraged me to continue to seek barriers that need to be broken in the scientific field. It has also reminded me that I am allowed to take up space and that where possible, I must strive to create that space for more minorities in the field. So with that, I thank you all for your attention and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Cathy. I think we have a question from Colette. Who wanted to start? Okay. Um, thank you, Katie. I wanted to first um, just take a moment to say thank you so much. Um, I'm actually quite speechless. This is like, it was really, really amazing to have you um, come and present to Fish 500. And I really appreciate also the time because it's Friday evening for you um, in the evening. And so it means that a special commitment to be able to share um, this amazing program with us. So I'm really grateful. Um, I, I guess I have lots of questions, but I just because there are so many really um, intricate pieces and also I think it was really amazing that you took the opportunity to sort of go into each and one of them and how they're all complementary and all really essential to making the program a success. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you is, you know, you, you, you really highlighted the success of this program in such a short amount of time. And so I'm just curious to know what are the next steps that you have? You know, where are, do you still have funding to support this moving forward? Are you planning to stay within South Africa for now, or also expand it to sort of um, neighboring countries? Um, anyways, just about the future, and then you can do with the question whatever you want. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. It's a really good question. Um, and I think, so we have uh, two more years of funding. Um, we need to get the fellows sort of out the door and all of them graduated. Um, and then I think the, so probably in the next year, what we're going to do is, is try to look for other avenues of funding. Um, ideally, the vice chancellor will come back with another 5 million rand, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but I think we've been able to demonstrate the, the power of this program. And so I'm hoping that sort of more on the philanthropic side of funding, we'll be able to, you know, find a, a different sort of unique way to fund the program, because I, 
I, I would hate to see it stop, um, especially with COVID happening in the middle. You know, I feel like we really haven't been able to leverage things like the the training programs we had planned for at sea or the retreats we had planned for the fellows. Um, you know, we haven't had the chance to to sort of explore any of those, and, and we'd really like to see that happen. Um, it's not a cheap program. You know, I mean, we spend lots of money each year on what is essentially six students, right? Um, but it's so much more than that. I think because of the the, the vision and the image and the, the outreach and the connections to people, it, it's a lot more than just six students. But the reality is to fully fund six students and, and all of this is, is not cheap. And so I think that is going to be our biggest challenge. Um, and then in terms of other outside, I think right now, I mean, we have, in terms of our sphere of influence right now is our department at the University of Cape Town. Um, of course, our sphere as individual researchers is larger than that because all of us are part of various international organizations. And one of the things we'd really like to do, and this also has to do with COVID, um, is have some of the fellows shadow us. So when you're going to a scientific steering committee meeting, you know, whether it's SUS, SOLAS, Ember, you know, what all these things are is to bring the fellows um, with you. And that's something that we'd like to do to connect more with the international community. Um, but I really think, you know, we're, we're sort of focused on our sphere of influence. But the, the last thing I'll say on that is um, we want to have a formal evaluation process of the program. We want to have external people evaluate and, and give us some feedback on how things could be improved. And then we'd like to put something together as a sort of more formal resource um, on the lessons learned and, you know, sort of mistakes made and, and successes to be put out for the broader oceanographic community. That would sort of be the ultimate end goal um, when everything's wrapped up. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, there is a question from one of our students, Julia. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, my question was sort of, you, you spoke a bit about having to have buy-in from folks at like the top level to sort of get something like this going. And you also sort of mentioned that like students aren't trained to sort of handle the, like those kind of difficult conversations and sort of how to navigate this. So like, what I guess how did you guys deal with like the power dynamic and trying to implement a program like this and sort of what what would you like say to students who are in our position who would maybe want to try and implement something like this or you know just some program because it's a really really cool program it's amazing that you guys were able to do it so cool thank you um yeah the power dynamics are challenging especially thankfully the so the first thing I'll say is that it was all of the women in our department who came together to do this, one of whom is our head of department. So that helps, right, immediately that that the, the sort of reticence amongst staff who would be senior to me are sort of naturally junior to her. And so having that sort of cross level of support helped a bit. Um, having the program funded, of course, by the head of the university naturally helps. I mean, right, and that's something that no one can control. You can't go out and make your president sort of do this from the top down. And so immediately a lot of our issues around power dynamics were sort of, were not roadblocks because of the way the program came about and because of the structure of who was, you know, designing the program within the department. So, and, and I do think that is something, a reason that we were able to have success relatively quickly because we didn't have to deal with those kind of, of roadblocks. Um, in terms of students not being trained for difficult conversations, I mean, look, we're not either. No, none of us are. We're all a bunch of awkward scientists. Having any conversation can be challenging, let alone oh. a difficult conversation, right? Um, so, yeah, so, so that's where I think the, the focus on your sphere of influence is important, um, as well as the focus on... Um, yeah, I would say that. So what you can do. So, you know, another thing I'm part of in the university is a decentering whiteness group. That's a self-formed group that that is of sort of like level people. You know, that's the sort of thing that that can create a lot of culture change without actually having to challenge power dynamics or, or challenge structures like that. Um, but when it comes to programmatic interventions, the reality is that you need that to be done at the staff level or, or at a higher level. Culture change can happen. Um, but real programmatic change, I think it does take some level um, of influence. Yeah, so, so thank you very much for the talk. <clears throat> As an African man, I appreciate what you're doing. I, I certainly uh, believe strongly that African women, Black women need 
need more space to be created than black men, black men, for example. So what you're doing is great. But, but and and uh, before I do that, uh, some, the, the thing is, you, you, the first statistics or so you presented kind of made me to start thinking when you said the department is 100% white, you know? So it seems to me that the problem is not just about black women, it's also the problem of black men, right? It's 100%. So, there's not space even for the men. So how is that? Is there any effort to also look at that or how is that for that department? <laughs> no, it's a good question. Um, so I will say that our department is fairly well represented with black African men from outside South Africa for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. That's not at the staff level though, of course. Um, the reason Ocean Women focuses on women is because our vice chancellor created a program called Advancing Women. I mean, it, it's, it was purely in response to that. Um, since then, we've hired a Black South African woman on staff. Um, and so, so that's a sort of positive step in the next direction. Um, but you're absolutely right. There, there's an equal problem here with the representation of Black men. And there are Black South African men in the PhD program. You know, there are Black South African men postdocs. So, and there have been for years, way much faster than we've ever been able to get Black women into the program. So yeah. why are they, are they not staff? I agree with you. It's, a, it's one of these things, you know, where people say, oh, eventually the pipeline will trickle up. And it's like, well, we've had this pipe bursting at the seams and it has yet to trickle, sure. you know, in, mm -hmm. in, in any direction. So I think probably it does require its own sort of, um, you know, it would be great to see a, a focus program on that. But but that's, I think there's a difference then between sort of university level issues and departmental level issues. At university, we do better as a university with Black South African staff lecturer at the academic level than we do as Black women. Yeah. Um, our department doesn't, but sort of at the bigger level, the faculty and the, and the university are doing um, much better in that regard. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's 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 yeah. cool. Yeah. And and like I said, I really I, I support all that you're doing because really, the pain is more on on black women than men. There's no question about that. Oh. You mentioned something. If I can quickly add, when you said, "Why why do we have to eat white food?" That was quite something. I've never <laughs> heard that before, right? And and yeah. and for my for my colleagues here and. Uh, you you are you're thinking why is that why is that and it's not the big things there's no law saying you can eat South African food in the in the staff room or something but you come in and you open your food the the the, the small questions and the small uh, eye eye looks you know just makes people to stop bringing it right it's it's quite something I've not heard that before but that's interesting thank you for that also. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, you know, you come to a seminar in South Africa at the University of Cape Town and you're eating the same mini muffins that yeah. you're eating at a seminar, you know, yeah. in the Midwest. It's, it's silly. <laughs> I know. Wonderful. Thank you. Good effort. All the best. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. I have a series of questions from Rebecca Hansen. Unfortunately, she cannot ask it. Uh, she cannot take because she has construction in our home. The first question is, what has been the most unexpected source of resistance or support for your program? For me, the most unexpected source of resistance I found is, is sort of random Twitter trolls. People who will respond to content we put out by saying, oh, it's the fall, you know, UCT used to be a great university and now this is the fall of it because there's, you know, they're just giving money to you for being a black woman. They're not giving money to you for being a good student, you know, it's the beginning of the end. Um, and I found that for me, at least personally, was the most sort of surprising place of resistance, um, it, you know, is why, and maybe that's just my own naivete about social media, that that's just something that exists. But I didn't really expect to have sort of general random old people on the internet having objections to the Ocean Women program. Um, another question is, do you have resources you would recommend to other white women academics for educating themselves so they can lead better? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. Um, one of the challenges we found was that a lot of the resources were heavily North American and European in terms of like scholarly resources about decentering whiteness or about creating these types of programmatic change. 
Um, and so, yeah, if someone's interested, I would very happily share our proposal, um, which has quite a bit of, you know, we, we sort of did do some literature search around this. And then if somebody's really interested, um, we have a massive list of resources as part of our decentering whiteness program um, that I would happily share. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to I want to make a, a quick comment and then a, and then a question. So the comment is that the I think the importance of having different types of uh, communication because I I learned about this through the um, plus uh, blog post that you mentioned, Casey, and that got me onto the, the the Twitter site, which is amazing. It's very inspirational, incredibly active, and yeah, there's some really good content. So that's been that's been fantastic. Um, my question is about um, so what happens what happens beyond the program for these students? Are you considering um, like strategies for opening up uh, the job market in academia and beyond? Yeah, so with that, we've sort of been a bit personalized. Each of the fellows have their own interests, um, but we've definitely tried to, and this is something that they find sort of somewhat shocking. Um, We've done the sort of tried to do the old boys network for them a bit. You know, we we put them forward, we introduce them to people, we make a big deal, and they you know, I can't believe you're doing all this for us. And what we're saying is, how do you think these guys are getting jobs? They're getting jobs because this is what everyone's doing for them, right? We're just doing for you now what has been traditionally done for others. Um, and that's been really interesting to see that that sort of um yeah, their response to that, you know, that that not being used to given that that sort of treatment. Um, but I think, you know, it, it comes down to their each own individual interests. Um, you know, as long as we have money, we will support them to get get out there in whatever capacity they want um, and see, you know, where it takes them. But I think the the very quickly, they don't need us. They don't need the program anymore. You know, the connections that they've made. You know, Kalisa has 12,000 Twitter followers. You know, what can I do for her in terms of introducing her to people? You know what I mean? That um, that there there is a sort of roll on effect. But um, I would like to have a situation where, you know, we have these cohorts so that the alumni, as they go on, you know, Ashram and alumni are then helping new students who come through. And, and that would be great. But that takes time and money. Thanks so much for, for the talk. I, I really enjoyed listening in and really agreed with the point you just made that I find there's often this paradox around, you know, that there's so much working against people of color getting into these positions. And then the moment that they get there, it's like, oh, well, it's a given because you're a person of color. Um, so I think it's a really good point for people to, to hear. Um, you you spoke a lot about like owning mistakes and talking about like personal struggles in this, which I so, so commend. And I'm just curious if you can give guidance. I, I hear a lot as an indigenous faculty member um, about people wanting to engage, but a great deal of fear in, in making a mistake. And I'm just wondering if you can offer any kind of guidance on overcoming that inertia and becoming comfortable in the uncomfortable. But thank you again. Yeah, thanks. It's a really good question. Um, that's where I think I still have that fear of of making a mistake, saying the wrong thing. You know that I'm that, and and I think there's a couple parts to it. One, I think that the reality is you still are surrounded by so much privilege that even if you make a pretty big mistake, you're probably going to come out fine on the other side, right? I mean, this is the the sort of white middle class privilege we carry around with us. Um, the other thing I think is really wrapping your mind around the idea of impact versus intent. You know, that just because you didn't intend to do harm, you have to accept responsibility for the fact that, that the impact was harmful. Um, and that that doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It just means that you did something that had a negative impact on someone, right? Um, and then the last thing I would say is, is this decentering whiteness group that I'm a part of at ECT has been really amazing at this because it's created, it's a small group um, of only white staff intentionally created with, to be only white staff. There's a parallel group at the university called the um, anti-racist working group. And then there's a third one, um, centering blackness. Um, and that has created almost like a safe space for the, to have these kinds of conversations with colleagues around, you know, what are strategies for, you know, I found myself in this situation, what's a strategy or, you know, how are you handling, dealing with difficult colleagues who aren't on board with this? 
Um, and what we've sort of come to as a group is that you, you have to put yourself out there. You have to say things, you have to do things um, and accept the fact that yes, you are gonna make a mistake and that's gonna be difficult. And essentially that when, when you create this almost like support group, you know, it's like, then we can come back to each other and for you and can feel bad for yourself and talk about it and then you move on. You know, and, and you go off and, and you learn from it and you try to do something else. But I think this point that the amount of time and energy that colleagues in science spend who are not part of the sort of majority group, the amount of time, energy, money, resources that they spend just participating, just belonging, just navigating a system that isn't designed for them is huge. And I think we have an obligation to, to spend that time, energy, resources, money on doing this kind of work and doing better and accepting the fact that yes, it impacts your scientific output, but you know what, it impacts their scientific output too. So, sorry, I feel like that was a bit of a rant, but. <laughs> so that's a, a very important uh, note to, to end on, Katie. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, we've come to the end of the time, so we're going to, we have to draw to a close, unfortunately. Um, Thank you once again for making the time to do this. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, this was a it was a really inspiring talk, and uh, it's really it's a wonderful program, Ocean Ocean Woman. And I would yeah certainly encourage people to to check it out on Twitter and and learn more about the um, um, the program. Thank uh, you so much, everyone. Really appreciate you taking the time to come listen. <laughs>